Gentlemen, continuing on our uh, Industry Relations Committee Industry Day agenda. Welcome you now to this session that's devoted to Boeing's Commercial Crew Starliner and as a perspective from the ISS. Um, I'm going to, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for this panel, who is Mr. Jim Chilton, who is the Senior Vice President for Boeing Space and Launch Business Area. I think one of the interesting things to, to point out uh, from Jim's perspective is, is that his portfolio includes the International Space Station, the CST-100 Starliner commercial crew vehicle, that's going to be a subject of this uh, panel discussion, uh, NASA's Space Launch System, as well as a number of other satellite systems and Boeing's participation in the United Launch Alliance. So it's a, it's a great uh, portfolio. Um, so before I turn it over to, uh, to Jim, I'm going to also give a shout out to Mark Mulqueen, who's going to be one of the panelists. Mark, you've done a great job as a co-vice chair on the Industry Relations Committee. Thank you for, for all your work on this. Appreciate that. So without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let me turn it over to Mr. Jim Chilton. Thank you. Mic check here. I see nods. Thank you. All right. As, as Robbie mentioned, I'm Jim Chilton. Thank you for that kind introduction. I uh, have the privilege of leading a pretty cool group of people doing some fun work. Today we're going to talk a little bit about things that are right upon us from a schedule perspective and we think or we hope are of great interest to you. I'll start with some uh, introductions. I'll start with Mark Mulqueen. Mark Mulqueen manages uh, for Boeing the, the, all of our work on the International Space Station, largely under contract to NASA, but that does include some commercial work with NanoRacks and some other efforts like that. And of course, he's been very busy trying to get the station ready for receipt of commercial crew vehicles, but also some other things. So I'll ask him to talk about what, what's going on on the station and what the future might hold. By way of bio, Mark is what I, I think the Navy might call a plank owner in the International Space Station. From early, from the time it became a, okay, we've got to do real product development here. It's got to be designed, it's got to be tested, and we've got to get it into launch packages and put it together in orbit. You know, Mark has been deeply involved in all of that technical work and progressed up through the ranks managerially. We have pulled him away to do other things from time to time, but somehow he finds his way home to the space station program, we've noticed, Mark. But anyway, I hope, I hope you enjoy his deep expertise on the topic and look forward to your questions. Immediately to my left is Chris Ferguson. Chris uh, came to Boeing by way of the astronaut corps at NASA. He actually commanded the last space shuttle mission, the final mission, and has been you know, just an absolute blessing for us to teach the managers and engineers what, what is the best way to kind of put a safe and simple solution that's going to be useful for a flight crew. So we've, we've had you know, just a great time learning from Chris and hopefully have shared a few things along the way with you. So with that said, let me see if I can get this, this work. And there's a, there's a picture of Mark's pride and joy. And there is, uh, there's your ship, Chris. So let, let me, I'll go right into a couple, let me prime a couple of questions with you guys. Uh, so for Chris, maybe Maybe just tell us what's going on on Starliner and how you're, what you're doing to get ready to go fly. Uh, thanks, Jim. So uh, it, we are, we are uh, really on the cusp of uh, what is going to be a spectacular couple months here. Um, I think a lot of you have followed, uh, followed along. You know that the commercial crew program is something that the country uh, desperately needs to uh, you know, return U.S. astronauts uh, and partner astronauts up to the International Space Station from U.S. soil. Uh, and uh, in less than two weeks, uh, we're scheduled to execute our uh, what we call pad abort test. That's a, a demonstration test of the ability of the vehicle to, uh, uh, by vehicle I mean the spacecraft, to rapidly uh, separate itself and uh, in, in time and distance from, uh, from the launch vehicle should something go uh, perilously wrong with the launch vehicle. So the, uh, the, the defining point for us will be, and, and I call this an ejection seat for a spacecraft, um, is, uh, is zero, zero, uh, and uh, you know, so we'll go zero speed, zero altitude, and uh, safely demonstrate uh, ab about a one mile high trajectory, one mile uh, downrange capability to uh, remove the vehicle uh, and safely uh, bring it down 
what will be the desert environment for our White Sands test, but would be uh, just off the coast of Florida if this vehicle had, in fact, uh, been on the launch pad. So uh, a lot of uh, everything that we've been working on for the last eight years or so all wrapped up in about a 90-second test, so it'll be pretty exciting. Uh, shortly after that, uh, on or about uh, December 17th, we're going to uh, launch our uh, OFT, our um, operational test flight. This will be an uncrewed test flight of the Starliner. Uh, it will launch, it will phase for about 24 hours, uh, catching up to the International Space Station all the while, going through a lot of onboard system checkouts. It will dock to, uh, to station, remain there for about a week, uh, and, then, uh, and then return back to one of our four landing sites in the western U.S. So it's a, a pivotal uh, couple months for us as, as we get ready to, uh, to fly crew uh, coming up here, uh, you know, pending the safe and su uh, successful outcome of these two test flights. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, I can attest, even though that this, it shows us installing the, uh, the crew module onto the service module here, that that vehicle is fully stacked and, uh, and installed out on the launch complex at White Sands. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, the OFT uh, vehicle. That is uh, what we call Spacecraft 3, is in the, uh, the former OPF, Orbiter Processing Building Number 3 at the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, the one thing to keep a, a real close eye on is the rollover date when we roll out of the OPF-3 and over to the Atlas V Vertical Integration Building scheduled for on or about uh, November 11th. So that'll be a key date uh, to, uh, to look for as we march towards our uh, launch campaign and uh, targeted launch date of December 17th. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, I mentioned pending the safe and successful outcome of those two, uh, we'll get ready to launch crew. And the crew will consist of uh, myself, as a, as a Boeing astronaut, and uh, Mike Fink, who is uh, no stranger to the International Space Station. He's been there a couple times before, uh, most recently as a crew member on STS-134. And then uh, this will be Nicole Mann's first flight. She's a Marine Corps uh, Colonel F-18 pilot uh, of another fine Boeing product, and uh, she's just absolutely awesome. We're looking forward to introducing her to what space flight's uh, all about. So. There you go in a nutshell, Jim. That's, uh, that's what we are up to. And uh, again, stay tuned. It's, it's going to be a spectacular couple months. Busy time for sure. Heading for a happy holiday. OK, Mark, been a lot of activity around the station. One of my observations on station is uh, there's a lot going on, and people kind of don't notice you. The larger NASA and International Partner Station team, I would say, quietly succeeds. You know, had some interesting EVAs. Uh, I can tell you, as a, as a parent of 20-somethings, they've always taken for granted that an interesting fact for everybody to consider, uh, the station was first tended, she's 21 years old, and, the and she's been permanently occupied so long that the students in the U.S. who graduated high school this spring have never known a world where humans didn't live permanently in space. Once it was occupied, it has, we've, you know, as human beings, we've never given up our foothold in space. We've rotated crews, but always always kept her that way. So, you know, in this mode of quiet success, maybe you could share some of the cool stuff you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Uh, first of all, I started with a shout out to last Friday's EVA with uh, Christine Koch and Jessica Mir. What an outstanding uh, dual fe female EVA, first time ever, and congratulations to both of them, to NASA, to uh, all of uh, humankind. So we're very proud of that. And as we say in the space business, uh, everything was performed as expected, and quite a few get-ahead tasks were done. So all uh, assessments were uh, positively reviewed at the conclusion of that EVA. So great teamwork and, and great accomplishments. You know, ISS has been spinning around uh, Earth. We, we think it's, uh, it's easy, but uh, before you uh, realize it, we've gone 1.2 billion, that's a billion, miles around the Earth in the last 21 years. That's equivalent to going from Earth to Mars in a kind of an, an average trajectory and back 21 times. So when you think about ISS and what it's doing, and as we talk about the gateway and Mar Moon and Mars, ISS is showing that we do understand how to build uh, platforms that will safely keep humans alive allow us to do science research, to have vehicles visit, go back down to other planets, and eventually utilize the same skills and techniques to build the, the Mars uh, platform, that uh, transportation vehicle. So very exciting, and we have to realize what we've been doing in the last 21 years 
is really to afford us the experience, the base, to keep going further and further into our, our atmosphere. You know, ISS has uh, completed about uh, 3,000 onboard experiments. Uh, discovery is going on continuously, both uh, from uh, universities, from medical field, from uh, agencies, and from uh, aerospace companies. Uh, if you think about some of the, uh, what we're doing, some things in, in diseases, and in, in Duchenne's disease that was discovered, an extra water molecule several years ago, that's still in the works to see if we can improve um, the life expectancy for those with the terrible disease. Uh, we're looking at, uh, right now on board, cancer uh, therapy. Is there, a, is there a drug that can more uh, attack the cancer cells and not the good cells and be more effective in the fight against cancer? Uh, human um, medical uh, or human health. When we go to deep space, it's not going to go there just to get there. We have to do a mission when we get there. That includes uh, maybe physically doing an EVA, physically going down to landers, down to the surface, walking on the moon, getting back in that ascent vehicle and coming back safely and then returning to Earth. All those require physical uh, constraints on the human body. And as we learn how to keep our crew in low Earth orbit uh, physically fit, uh, mentally ready, those are the things, the same skills that the uh, Human Health Organization at NASA is uh, putting in place so that we can be ready when we go to deep space. ISS is uh, continuing to, to mature and morph, as we say. 21 years old, as uh, Jim said, but it's, uh, it's uh, as our 21-year-olds in, in human life expectancy, we're really just at the cusp of being an adult and doing all that we can do. So I think about ISS, just the experiments we're performing. We're changing out batteries right now, completing several more EVAs this, uh, this month and next. We have the uh, AMS upgrades that uh, We'll make that deep space payload uh, uh, experiment uh, continue to operate for the next eight to ten years and continue to gather data uh, from deep space as it uh, penetrates into our atmosphere and uh, comes to our direction. And just seeing what type of materials are out in deep space. So lots of things going on on ISS. It's a great uh, international cooperation, both agencies, uh, countries, and contractor communities, as well as uh, uh, big and small, and if you think about putting something to have communities, agencies, and countries work together, the uh, International Space Station was quite a, a plan and discovery back in the uh, early to mid-90s to put that in place, and I, I'm very proud of all that I've done. Uh, coming back to ISS, Jim, it's because there's so much to do. It's an exciting program, great team members. Um, internationally, domestically, a uh, great contractor community. So it's a, it's a, and we have uh, goals every day. You know, we are up there every day doing things. We have anomalies that occur and have to be resolved overnight. The team, works, team members that we have on Boeing and all the contractor communities are working very, very hard to make sure we are safe, that the crew is ready to do what they need to do, that the hardware is there that's going to operate, and that uh, we perform the mission as expected. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for what you do there. I've been amazed by the quantity of visiting vehicles lately and the docking and the amount of work you're doing on the station, so well done. Okay, I want to I want to pivot back to flight crews. I think we have a we can play a video and then maybe get back to Chris. In years, there's gonna be more than just one space station. In fact, when we'll say, oh, the space station, people say, which one? And that's gonna be really neat. We're gonna have people that are gonna be able to to everyday people regular scientists and engineers, even people with tourists, they can buy a ticket to, to go see, to go to the space stations in orbit. We're gonna be manufacturing new things that are gonna make life better on planet Earth. And there's a great uh, unique opportunity for our country, United States, to, to establish these industries in low Earth orbit, to make life better on planet Earth and continue the engine of our, of our economy of high tech. I don't think astronauts are as famous today as they used to be, nor do I think they should be. If everybody who ever flew into space became infinitely famous, then we're not making it available for anybody to go do it. So when we get into an airliner, who knows the name of the captain of the airliner? Nobody knows the name of the captain of the airliner. And if, if space flight is ever going to become as commonplace as we'd like it to be, um, astronauts are just pilots who get people back and forth to space. 
really going to be this combined effort, probably with multiple commercial industries working together along with government. And I think that's how we're going to see the future of space exploration, you know, to the moon and then eventually to Mars. You know, we don't have, we wouldn't be able to sustain that type of exploration without commercial industry. Um, and really a lot of it comes down to is the people, right? You need the people, you need the ideas, and you need those folks that come in, and it's good to have a little bit of that commercial competition, right? It keeps everybody going and, and pushing forward towards a goal. Okay, well, that, thanks for those comments on the video. So Chris, you've, you've been, you've commanded space shuttles, you've served on the space station, so you, you could, you know the look back role of an astronaut. And I wonder if you would share with us your thoughts on what, what the job of an astronaut could be going forward. Um, thanks, Jim. So as a part of a, a Boeing, very small but very real cadre of astronauts, you know, we've been, uh, we've been asked, hey, what, is, is Boeing going to start entertaining, uh, you know, applications for those who might desire to fly a Boeing vehicle? Um, I don't think we've reached that point at yet, but I can certainly see that it's going to lean to be a, a much, um, uh, sort of a, a, different, um, a different way of looking at business. And, and let me just explain. So I, I see the sphere of influence of commercial spaceflight. And when I say commercial spaceflight, I mean a sort of a, a fee for service of transporting humans back and forth to low Earth orbit, transporting cargo uh, back and forth to low Earth orbit with an ever-expanding sphere of logistical support that's needed to support the NASA exploration mission. So as, as NASA continues to push forward, whether it be the gateway or beyond to Earth, there will always be this logistical support chain that comes behind it in the form of a commercial company that, uh, that performs the fee that enables NASA to continue to do its exploration mission. And, and those vehicles, if they're piloted, will likely be piloted by commercial astronauts as the exploration mission uh, are, are crewed by NASA astronauts. Uh, and uh, and they're, they're just as likely to carry uh, the cargo back and forth again to support the, the exploration mission. So as we look forward, um, you know, my comment in there of, hey, will, if, if I if I choose to go to space someday or buy a ticket, you know, will I know who the commander is? And, uh, you know, you probably won't see it on television. Uh, it probably won't be a household name. Uh, it, it'll be just somebody who provides a service for me, a very unique service, uh, but still somebody who, uh, who I entrust, right, to, to go safely forth and, and uh, give me the experience in low Earth orbit, whether it be for manufacturing, whether it be for, uh, you know, um, some form of a national program uh, that a previous unspacefaring nation would, would participate in. Uh, or whether it's a, a tourism industry. Um, they're providing a service to me back and forth. It, I, I think the, the future is, is very open, it's very interesting. And both Boeing and NASA, I think, have come an awful long way in the last year uh, since the crew was named to define what are the roles and responsibilities for, say, a joint crew, or how do we manage uh, a, a NASA mission that is crewed or uh, partially crewed by uh, non-NASA astronauts. Thanks for that. Do you have any uh, any look ahead for what station crews or non-pilot type type roles might be? Um, well, you have seen the the, uh, the the general overview of the astronaut has changed considerably in the last 40 years. You know, we were previously consisted of mostly males, mostly test pilots, and uh, and that beginning with the very early vestiges of the shuttle program, and certainly going forward and culminating with even things like Friday, that you know this magnificent event. That I'm not so impressed that. Two women went out and did an EVA. I'm so I'm impressed that it took so long to do it. Uh, the, the the stage has been set for this for quite a while. So yes, the the, the demographics of your average astronaut has changed considerably to a scientist researcher, but always somebody who understood their vehicle well enough um, to act as a crew member. But now, as we get to uh, an era where we have uh, say paying industrial passengers who really aren't there for the ride back and forth. That's an administrative function to them. They really have a job to perform once they get in orbit. Uh, you know, that will, again, take that one extra step in what really is somebody is, who is defined as an astronaut. So it's, the demographics have, have changed. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Mark. You, know, you talked a little bit about looking backwards at the achievements of the station and how she's 21 years old and just starting, maybe starting life out. 
you know, there's much, much talk is happening about how long can the station last, last and what business models might it be operated in. So with, you know, non-binding, but what do you see possible futures for us? Yeah, great question. The, uh, you know, we have been looking at the life extension for quite a while. I think everyone knows we've already uh, cleared all the U.S. elements past 2030. Um, but in reality, we have looked much further than that, and uh, if we do it in 15-year increments, so the next one you would logically talk about is, is really uh, 2043, 2045. Um, virtually most of the IS, uh, ISS U.S. modules can get well past that, uh, well into that date. We've got some small pokeouts, and we'll, like you do in anything, even commercial airplanes, as we do analysis for fatigue, we'll look at those if we need to. It's all really about the politics, whether NASA, uh, the other agencies, uh, uh, and our, you know, politicians want to continue to uh, operate the ISS beyond its current plan. You know, the other thing is ISS, we have to think about uh, how we upgrade the International Space Station. Uh, small things like communication systems, you know, all the wiring is installed. You're not changing out wiring, but you are upgrading to newer state-of-the-art electronics and communication systems. And so those things are very well tested and, and, uh, and, and you know, and then built and, and uh, launched and then integrated. And sometimes we find uh, anomalies when we put those things in. And so we go off and work those. And so there's lots left to do. Um, we were talking about uh, the docking systems. You know, the ISS is ready for, for all the, uh, we have two docking ports for commercial crews. So theoretically, um, we can have two crew uh, vehicles up there at the same time. That way you can have, as you say, a direct handover of the crew. So I'm coming down, I can talk to you about what I have in work for science and you can pick it up right away and be more efficient. Um, so those are, those are a great advantage if you think about all platforms of the future of how to uh, hand off uh, logically and to, to do the right aspects of things. So the International Space Station is continuing to, uh, to morph into future opportunities, and I'm very confident that, uh, you know, given uh, maybe, even, I, I guess I should say that we expect that the U.S. Congress will probably release some policy probably in the next, uh, maybe before the end of the year, that actually says no earlier than 2030 for ISS which is very important for all the folks that, uh, some of you out in the audience that are payload providers want to make sure you have seven year runtime to start your experiment, build it, get it to orbit, run it, get your data back and, and improve life here on Earth or improve your products. So these are all important things to know how much runtime you have. And I think ISS will easily get to the 2030s and uh, beyond as we see the need. Sounds like the limit is not technical, it's more of a what, do you, what purpose do you want to serve? Well, maybe for both of you, I've, I've thrown in a kind of an odd slide here, but for both of you, I'll just put out, this, this is, a, this is a, an architecture, and, and this is kind of a conglomerate of things we've heard NASA and others talk about. And so this is a beyond Earth orbit architecture, but it includes what we're trying to do in low Earth orbit. I, I'll invite you to maybe talk about the future, both of you, what you think about. How, yeah, so I'll start because I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, Chris, we're talking about other platforms for you to visit, your, your CST-100, which is a reality. We, we probably can have multiple low Earth orbit platforms that uh, could survive and exist uh, at the same time. And I was talking about the technologies of ISS going to the gateway architecture. You're going to talk about the big 4.2 meter type modules, solar arrays, power systems that the power and propulsion elements already in work. Um, that's really going to get us back to the moon. We talked about uh, um, NASA's got a broad area announcement out for lunar landers, which there's all kinds of activities happening on that. You know, the big, uh, the big rocket, we're not talking much about it here, but they're going to have their green run, which is uh, all engines full throttle in, in January time frame. They're, they're shipping from MAF to Stennis uh, this December. And so the rattle of that uh, biggest rocket ever built is going to occur. And it's pretty exciting. If you see everything lining up, uh, Ryan's been at work. So our path to moon and beyond is, uh, is very much uh, set as a community, as a, all the agencies commu co commuting, uh, uh, com doing this in conjunction with uh, opportunities. So I'm pretty excited about that. I think uh, it's 
just to quote a previous uh, associate administrator, uh, who we all, I believe, think very highly of, you know, it's not an either ISS or the moon or Mars. It's really an and. The reason being is, if you think about all that we have going on in deep space in the future, if the crew can't train in a more accessible, easier to get to, long duration platform, the first times they'd be in space would be going to the moon or to Mars. I think the uh, criticality of experience uh, is very important to our crews, getting the, the feet wet, continuing to walk. What's your, what's your thoughts on that since we're wandering into crew considerations? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I have always been a, a strong proponent of our presence in low Earth orbit. Um, it can't go away. Um, yes, you know, NASA has been kind, the taxpayers have been kind to, you know, uh, foot this tremendous investment in the form of the International Space Station for 30 years. Um, and I'd like to say it will last forever. Um, and, and, it, and it may with periodic upgrades, but, but I do believe that eventually there has to be a successor. And, and I just look at these commercial providers off building uh, this, these capabilities to get back and forth to low Earth orbit. I mean, it's been 40 years in this country since we designed a human-rated spacecraft to leave the planet. And, and I think you can, look at, uh, you can look at our schedules and say, hey, this is not easy, right? This is very challenging. It's a hard thing to do. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we do it, we're going to do it right, and we're going to do it safe, and we're going to make this a vehicle that will be in service for another 10, 20, 30 years. So if you, if you just look at the landscape right now, you look at ISS, hey, it'd be wonderful till 2030. Uh, the grim reality is that's only 10 years away, yep. and uh, we need other commercial companies and destinations up there, again, whether it's tourism, whether it's industrial manufacturing, whether it's drug production, whether it's... Uh, you know, countries that were never spacefaring countries who want the pride and ownership of, of even a short-term lease of a space program, there needs to be the destination there to continue to support this business and this business model. Plus, uh, I, I would hate to think that we would ever gap our ability to go evaluate new, uh, new equipment in low Earth orbit. I eventually, we are going to leap off and, and go on a three-year mission to Mars. Uh, these systems that we have been able to, you know, prove without a doubt aboard the International Space Station, environmental system, uh, you know, right now we have the thermal amine scrubber, which I believe is a new, uh, new component for CO2 removal up there. I mean, we have constantly been able to prove on these absolutely positively cannot fail components that keep the crew alive for long duration space flight. We've been able to prove them in the comfort and, and, re and relative, you know, safe in terms of I can get home quickly if, uh, if I have to. Uh, environment of International Space Station low Earth orbit, and we will always need that capability. So, and, and we would like to think that we're always going to be there to provide that transportation service to get back and forth. You know, we are reaching a realm where it is no longer as much about the trip as it is entirely about the destination. So. Okay, maybe, maybe let me close with this. What are the, uh, if you want to step out there a little bit, what are the odds we break our streak of keeping humans living continuously in space. Have we, have we put a strong foothold and we're staying for good, or how's it gonna shake out here, gentlemen? I didn't, I didn't warn them I was gonna ask this, so. Well, I, I think you know where I'm headed, right? It, it's, I have faith in the system. I, I know that there are, uh, there are entities out there, whether it's a, um, a morphing of the International Space Station over to a more commercial model, or whether it is some of the other uh, companies out there, like the Bigelow Aerospaces, that have been sort of you know, hinging on the cusp of uh, orbiting uh, another commercial entity. I'd like to think that we have, we have 11 years, right? If we can uh, have Space Station to 2030, we have 11 years. That is enough time to do this. We need another destination, uh, and, and I believe we'll get there, because we won't let ourselves gap. We'll realize the importance um, of a, sort of a continued presence in low Earth orbit. Yeah, you're so true, but uh, you know, NASA has uh, developed some some commercial ideas to try and get another module or a free flyer to station. So I think there's some smart ideas out there to help uh, some companies put some ideas together, get their, their backing and get their team in place to build a successful co-orbiting platform or attach to ISS for a while. As you say, you're right, ISS is, uh, it is an aging vehicle. Um, probably, uh, so Jim, for your bet, it's, well, let's, let's see if we can go for, uh, uh, how about uh, 30 years? That would be pretty uh, successful. And then, you are, who knows? You, are, you have ISS in your DNA. <laughs>
and then we'll hope that uh, someone else can pick it up with a handover. We'll give a torch to the uh, baton. All right, well, that's, uh, that's good fun. A little look at Starliner. Uh, you know, in the short term, getting Starliner back and forth to ISS, she's, she's got to deliver crew, she's got to be a lifeboat. God, that's, that's job one for you guys, but I appreciate the look ahead. So I think what we'll do uh, is maybe segue into questions. The, before I do that, I'd like to, Mark, I want to, you have committed an enormous amount of your work in life to making the space station reality. I want to thank you for that. And Chris, you have obviously hung it out there in the breeze and beyond to make sure we can learn to live and work and keep advancing as in somewhat something like what we saw on the slide. So let me thank you for that. If I could ask for a round of applause for these panelists. Okay, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. We are going to have to wrap up a little bit early. I know you guys have commitments. Well, let's see. Well, there's one right on the top. Looks pretty good. What's the plans for a station after it's retired? What's, what's life without a station look like? And the question references a hotel, but... Do you ever, do you ever, do you ever see it turning into a completely private entity? Or? Well, I... You know, coming from Houston, I'll say the, uh, the Astrodome and the hotel idea is always uh, one of those things you can never take on because it's too big. Station may be in that same uh, challenge because of the uh, mass size of it and the complexity of the systems on there for someone to uh, try to turn it into a hotel and, and, and re maintain safe uh, operating conditions. Um, it would have to be uh, quite, a, quite an event to do that. Um, but, you know, <laughs> whenever it is, whatever that day is, it will be a, uh, a great ticket for a cruise in the Southern Hemisphere when we plan that date for uh, re-entry. And uh, there's lots of work to do for us to ever plan that completely with uh, how to uh, get in the right orbit and whether we break it up at all beforehand. Lots of uh, effort with NASA to decide and, and the international agencies to, to plan that. But uh, we'll use the ISS as, as much as it's uh, safely uh, ready and affordably to, to uh, serve its, its needs. I picture Mark sort of hugging the space station during the deorbit burn, saying, don't let it go, you know, so one, one more orbit, please. Prying the headset out of his hands. Is that a bumper sticker? <laughs> okay, there's one from Alex. It's about the Australian workforce. Maybe I could take this, guys. Uh, thanks for the question. Fantastic observation and entirely true. Uh, some people don't know, Boeing is a large defense contractor in Australia, and over the last two years, we've kind of committed and signed an MOA with the Australian Space Agency to try to help develop uh, space capability. We're in the middle of working that out. I met with the Minister of Industry yesterday on the matter, and kind of, if I was going to frame where we are, it's across civil and military space. Uh, Boeing, uh, I know many other companies are also very engaged with Australia because it's attractive, but from our standpoint, what we do in Australia is native. For instance, the training that astronauts on the station will receive, you know, remember the Starliner when she's in service will be up there six months, so crews will need to train before they return. The actual virtual reality training that's being developed is being developed in Australia. The team's that sharp. So our, our playbook is to kind of put work in Australia and Australians deliver the goods, if you will. We're in the middle of kind of figuring out what, what those permanent roles might be, at least for Boeing, how we might fit in our permanent supply chain. So thanks for that question. Mark, how old is the Internet ISS? Uh, let's see, December 6th, we have our 21st birthday. 1998 is when we launched. Fantastic. There's one maybe for Chris and I. The Starliner capsule bears a resemblance to the Apollo capsule. Is that intentional? You want me to start in you, Riff, or vice versa, or what do you want to do? I, I doubt I can do better than you. So let me go first, and then you can pick up the pieces that, uh, that I miss. It, it, it's a... Uh, you could say it's intentional. Uh, a lot of people look at, um, you know, they look at this space shuttle versus uh, a capsuled vehicle and they say, you know, why? Um, I mean, my answer is really safety. Um, when we flew the, the shuttle, it was the payload and the people, right? It was 50,000 pounds of payload, it was seven people. So you really had to human rate your capability to get large payloads to space. So I had to human rate the entire rocket to ensure I could get 50,000 pounds of payload there. 
I think uh, probably a, uh, sort of a more safety uh, and, and hazard, um, you know, sort of a risk-based approach would be to say, hey, why don't I put the people on a smaller rocket where I can human rate a, a, a smaller element, and, and we deferred back to the, uh, to the Apollo design. I even think that, and, and by, by the way, I think there's a huge amount of data on that design that's from the Apollo era, so there was a bit of an aerodynamic shortcut that we were able to take. I even think the sidewall angle uh, is very, uh, uh, very duplicative of what the uh, of what the Apollo capsule was. So, yes, it's it's by intention, and it was uh, it was to um, leverage work that had been done uh, quite extensively back in the 60s. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll take an engineering cut at it from a kind of a functional architecture standpoint. There's some real attractive reasons to architect Starliner the way she is, and I think they were true during Apollo. First, if you look at our service module. That's where all the hypergolic propellants are, so we really have separation of all that, that propellant from the crew compartment. You know, you've got a heat shield and, a, and, and the like. Uh, so, you know, that, that's pretty simple. And those kind of devices can be made repeatably in, a, in an expendable production. And, th and that allows you to have a, you know, our, our crew module is fully reusable. And I've, re I've gotten a few questions on LinkedIn and about this same topic and others recently about people didn't realize we've got a reusable crew module. So that, that's a good reason to have a service module capsule standpoint. Another reason is you can discard that service module as you're beginning re-entry. It gives you maximum prop and control right to the point you re-enter. And then you discard it and the, and the weight you have to go put under the parachutes is less weight in CG. And I, and I think that's a real advantage because those chutes have to get the crews home safe. Our, our particular design doesn't splash down at sea. It lands on terra firma. That's our baseline. And we think that's more commercially attractive. It'll, it'll inspire more rides, and it's less likely to require rework flight to flight. But if you think about minimizing the mass under the chutes for crew protection, you know, just those are, those are two examples of, of why that architecture is attractive. And, you know, you've got to be humble. They figured it out on Apollo, and we, when we did the same trades, they came out the same way. But we didn't just start there. We actually went and traded it. And it still looks like a good way to go. One, uh, one interesting feature that Jim didn't mention is um, because we do land on land, uh, we have to cushion that final landing impact. So we have uh, an airbag system that is, uh, it rides out the, the entire mission between the heat shield and the, and the pressure hull. Uh, so about 3,000 feet off the ground on uh, the reentry sequence, we actually jettison that heat shield, which dramatically lowers the overall weight and decreases the descent velocity. So uh, another sort of design feature that's a little bit different than Apollo. Thanks, Chris. Okay, let's see. We're probably getting close to time here, but I'll. Uh, there's one there that says, "Are there applications for Starliner beyond the International Space Station?" Uh, I think we could quickly say yes. It's a lot of different. Well, I would I would defer to my original question, right? We we are really hoping for four different types of business out there. Whether it's uh, I, I mentioned tourism, right? Businesses from other countries who are interested in an indigenous program of their own that would be a sort of a lease opportunity. Um, you have uh, academia and you have uh, business and manufacturing. So yes, we are hoping for a, sort of a, a, an array of business that would be available after ISS. Okay. Commercial crew had some setbacks and, and got behind schedule, that's a fact. But we, you know, I, I guess I'll just give a quick flyby and then turn it over to you. We, we definitely saw learning in our tuning our propulsion system, and we had a surface module hot fire test failure out at the, at the desert, although we didn't lose a vehicle or anything. We, did, we had a thruster that didn't shut down, and that ended up in our choosing to do a more substantial redesign of the prop system than we anticipated. And, and that was really down in the components. We decided some of, the, some of the reliability and some of the redundancy that we needed to put in there had to get better, so that, that that was a pretty good hit. And I would also say that there's a lot of features in Starliner about being reusability and handing the crew control of things that are not like things we've done before. They're not spec like shuttle. And that has just been a little, little I'll, I'll say it's been a little more finicky than we anticipated it. We, sometimes we joke around the program, there's been a little bit of uh, pain by paper cut. There hasn't, there hasn't been any big wound, but there's just been a lot of little things that we had to stop and retune. So, you know, of course, you're in the sim. Flyinger, what do you think, Chris? So the autonomy aspect, and, and most spacecraft out there today are autonomous. Uh, th this um, the Starliner is unique in that it's 
it's by requirement supposed to operate autonomously, but be uh, enabled to be taken over by a crew member. And I think this sort of uh, dovetails into what Jim was saying. Uh, and similarly, once, uh, and mind you, we don't intend to do this. This is just, hey, if the autonomy steers me in the wrong direction, I want a crew member there to be able to take over and, uh, and right the ship, so to speak, and then turn it back over to the autonomy uh, and, uh, and let it continue on its way. So there's a two-way uh, handover, and that is unique, right? How, how, do, we, how do we seamlessly uh, execute this sort of change of command between an autonomous system, and how do we know the autonomous system is ready to assume uh, automatic control when the ship has been righted and the crew is ready to turn it over. So there has been a fair amount of learning through, uh, throughout the uh, you know throughout the entire program. Jim had mentioned uh, the incident we had with the propulsion system, but I think it's uh, you know I get back to my original point. We are on the cusp of uh, putting these behind us as we uh, we head off into a couple significant months of flight tests. So we're right on the cusp. Okay, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I'll, I'll uh, I see the question there about. Our crewed flight test schedule, I'll just let everybody know that uh, orbital flight test uncrewed to prove we can dock, and then crewed flight test is how we certify this system to go into service in kind of a way. And, and I, I personally think uh, that we're, there's got to be no less than a 60-day offset from OFT, and I think it's more than that. So I think you're in the first half of next year is what will make sense. The reason I'm dancing a little bit is not because I have any big fancy rollout to do on, from a press perspective, but it is an engineering exercise and we are working hard to make sure the technical teams are disciplined and systematic in the way we look at it. So we're, we're going to go fly our pad abort test and orbital flight test and then we're going to make the decision you're asking about. And with that, I think we have hit time. I know you gentlemen have other places to be. Thank you for your attention and uh, for the great questions. Thanks very much to Jim and the panel. Um, is there a question? Oh, is there? Can you come back to orbit? And can you come back from the gateway? With your permission, Dr. Aldrin. Dr. Aldrin, to ask a question, I'll repeat it in case people in the back couldn't hear. Can we return from lunar orbit and can we return from the gateway with a Starliner as designed today? She doesn't have the, the heat shield. I will grant you Moonliner has a nice ring to it, but our f and we may have done some IR&D along those lines, but sir, our focus today is getting crews back to station, but certainly it's an adaptable vehicle. Okay. Okay. Thank very you. Good. And I apologize for I was. Okay. Let's have another time. another uh, round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks again to Jim and Chris and Mark. I just want to remind you that we have uh, three more really exciting Industry Day events to come. Um, it, we uh, have a kind of founder CEO panel coming up. You know, we ha we with some diversity and celebrating the um, innovation and entrepreneurship that's occurring in, within the space sector, starting at 3:45. Uh, Joe Landon will be here moderating a panel of, as I said, uh, CEO founders of uh, four different companies. Uh, Peter Beck from Rocket Lab, uh, uh, Takeshi Hakamata from iSpace, Nobu Okada from Astroscale, and Robbie Shingler from Planet. And then immediately following that is a really exciting event at 4.30, and that is the um, IAF startup pitch session. So we'll have um, startups in here uh, pitching their, uh, their business concepts. And then the final event for Industry Day at 6 p.m. is a highlight lecture um, from Professor Enrico uh, Flamini, uh, a former Aussie chief scientist of the Italian Space Agency, talking about the quest for, uh, for uh, liquid water on Mars. So I hope you join us for all those events, and thank you very much. Enjoy the break, and we'll start resume again at 3.45, just to reiterate. Thank you. <laughs>